Good morning and welcome to this week's Jump Recruitment Discussion. This week we are joined by our special guest, Neil Carberry, who I'm sure you'll know is the head of the REC and does some incredible work for the recruitment industry and really has his finger on the beating pulse of the industry. So we're going to really test that beating pulse today and see what that looks like. But as usual, with all our webinars, we like to kick off with some stats. And today I'm going to use one of the REC friends and partners uh, who's done all the heavy lifting today for me on the stats, which is Greg Savage, and the stats about our marketplace. And I think some really interesting comments to sort of come from there. The UK industry, as we all know, as we reported a couple of months ago, is worth £42.9 billion in 2021. And that's a 21.7% uplift on 2020 and has a massive contribution to the UK economy. So it'd be interesting what we think is going to be like for 2023. OK, the UK is the third biggest staffing market globally behind the US and Japan. And I saw a stat the other day that said if you put the UK market, the German market, the Australian market and the Asian market together, that's the size of the US marketplace. However, there's 30,000 recruitment agencies in the UK. There's only about 20,000 recruitment agencies in the USA. So it says how competitive our market is. Of the 42.9 billion generated, 36.4 was via temporary work placements and 6.5 billion, and it is billion, remember, is via permanent placements. So regarding the placement numbers, the UK agencies placed 547,692 permanent people in 2021. We're still waiting for the 2022 figures. And 22.4 million temporary stroke contract workers last year. So if you look at that basically or weekly, that's 430,000 people placed in temporary jobs every week via recruitment people, agencies. That's a huge Eight, amount of people. 86,000 placements a day in the recruitment marketplace there are just over 201,000 people working in the uk market okay and research has published that at the end of 2022 the estimated forecast for 2022 is a 7.47% growth on fees generated in 2021 and a 14.3% growth on volume of recruitment agency clients in 2022 compared to 21. So it'll be again, interested to be from what Neil thinks that growth will be in 2023. As we know, 79.5% of the UK businesses are micro businesses and have 10 heads or less. The stat that really interested me though was this one 82% of recruitment businesses in the UK have a turnover, not gross profit, have a total turnover of less than £1 million. So I looked at that and said, that could be one temp biller whose billing total turnover is a million pounds. Gross profit might be 250. Net profit is when you take their costs off. Or it could be about four or five perm billers. So it depends on the size of the recruitment agency. And the final stat is there are 470 recruitment enterprises. So I think that's large recruitment agencies, RPOs, MSPs, etc., with over 250 employees in those businesses. So it says we are a huge market. There's a lot to look at in the market. So Neil, welcome. Thank you as always for coming on. I'm sure it's going to be a very enlightening session. So the guys from Jump, if you want to jump in at any time, feel free. Anybody on the, 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 the session who wants to ask questions to, to Neil, feel free to put them in the question box and work from there. So, Neil, let's kick off. The autumn statement. Let's just leave it as the autumn statement. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's best put there. But the spring statement is due on the 15th of this month. What's your expectations of that? And how do you think that will affect the recruitment industry? It's a really interesting question, Howard. Morning, everyone. And uh doi happus to all our Welsh uh, <laughs> friends. Uh, I had a great time down in Cardiff last uh, last Tuesday with at the REC Cymru Forum. Um, and uh, also worthwhile remembering that uh, so much is different in different parts of the UK. We've seen uh, with Northern Ireland in the last couple, uh, a couple of a couple of days. So when we think about government action, we think about how it lands across sectors, but also across the four parts of the of the UK. Um, I think there's a short and a long term to the to the spring budget, and it is a spring budget, not a spring statement, which is a change. But I think after the kind of 
the mess of all massive fiscal statements that weren't technically budgets over the last uh, few uh, months, uh, Jeremy Hunt feels very clearly that he needs to set down a marker with proper uh, advice from the OBR and others. If you think about it from a, a business perspective, at the REC, we think there's basically two things we need to be doing this year. Thing number two is we need to help recruitment agencies navigate this market, right? That is pretty core REC stuff. It's what we always do. Um, and we're very focused on doing it well. Thing number one is our sort of more external voice piece. Um, and I'm going to lump clients and governments together on this, which is, I think pretty generally, there is not an understanding that the world we live in now in the labour market is not the world of 2050. So I quite often say to REC members, when you see the REC in the media, when you see me or Kate in the media, I am not talking to the government. I am talking to our members' clients about how they need to change and about the market they need to navigate. You know, the best feedback I've had in the last 18 months about the REC is that the REC is starting to move some of this business I was talking to's clients' perceptions of the market. And that's really important that we do that. I think government's the same ostensibly uh, they are really struggling with high high levels of inactivity they are struggling with understanding the pay pressures in the economy of course they're a massive employer themselves their industrial relations strategy for the last six months in education and healthcare has been an absolute mess there's some signs that they've just begun to start to get hold of it in the last couple of weeks um so there's a whole piece there about what's the strategy fundamentally. So we're 18 months out from general election. There are some things that the current government can do. And we are looking for those things to start to build what we really need. And I say this as a kind of, as chief exec of the REC, but actually as chief exec of one of a group of trade associations who work closely together on British economic development. What's the plan? How do we stitch these things together? If NHS backlogs are holding up candidate supply for REC members, how do we address that? If the tax burden isn't incentivizing the right things, if the apprenticeship levy is taking money away and funding, no disrespect to KPMG graduate apprenticeships, but funding KPMG graduate apprenticeships rather than forklift truck driving courses for temps in warehouses, those things need to be addressed. So as we look into the to, to the budget on the 15th, I think I'm looking for Jeremy Hunt to start to show that he appreciates that economically the UK has been in a bit of drift for a few years. It then had a crisis last autumn, and now we're at risk of just being back in drift. A sensible budget would start to say, actually, we know we need to do something about NHS backlogs. We know we need to do something about inactivity. We know we need to do something about skills. We know we need to do something about childcare and start to seed those because that's the key thing. Now, it's very popular in parts of the business um, uh, uh, representative community, including my former employers, the CBI, to talk about industrial strategy. And, and there's a bit of a risk to industrial strategy because it's jobs for the boys. It's, you know, how do we make more cars? And I, I am interested in industrial strategy and economic strategy, but actually it's about how do you get more people to work? How do you train them? Um, and I think there's two bits of this that make this relevant to recruiters. One is it's getting um, government on pack with the problems that we are facing every day. The other thing is, if you look at the best stuff that's going on, like uh, the skills work that's going on in Manchester with Andy Burnham or in Birmingham with Andy Street, they understand that recruiters are right at the heart of that that recruitment is the professional service that makes a difference to this problem. And that is really powerful because that's what then flicks back to our clients. So I talk a lot about heads up, shoulders back, we're making a difference. You talk about number, the, the size of the industry. I think actually people are coming to appreciate that. And on the in the budget, they need to start putting in place the policies that will help us make a difference for the British economy. So looking at the British economy then, we're now sort of officially in recession. Last time we spoke, but yeah, it's uh, according to the stats, they're saying that, according to the stats I was reading, okay. The last time we... 
But if you look at it, last time we spoke, you said it, we, we started to see an uncoupling of the recruitment being the barometer for recession. Is that still the case? Is the, the economic climate changing compared to the recruitment economic climate? Um, so um, let's just say that the forecasters have come towards the REC's view of the economy over the last six months. In that, I think we've we've never been of the view that what we're about to see is some uh, great kind of fall off a cliff, and that 2023, you know, once you've sorted out the mess of the mini budget, 2023 is actually a low and slow year, and I think that's where the consensus now is and and because of that we've already seen in our data clients reacting to the change so temp market in our billings data has continued to grow month on month it's now grown for two and a half years in terms of activity levels part of that now is underpinned by the level of shortage you know candidates are, clients who are used to thinking per more temp only have one option, temp, because perm hasn't been there because it's so tight. The perm market has cooled quite significantly over four months from September, October to January. It, but it's not cooled in that kind of falling off a cliff we're having a massive recession way. And we also have to remember that when we talk about a cooling market, you have to start, start with where was the starting point? And the starting point was arguably the best market any perm recruiter has ever seen yeah. in the spring of summer last year. So it it being a bit slower in perm than 2022 still means, generally speaking, it's better than 2019, which wasn't a bad year for, per se. So I think I, th I think we're the other thing to say about perm is just through January and February, November, December, every member was saying to us. Clients have got the clients aren't gloomy, but they're cautious. So they've kicked it all into January. What we saw at the end of January into February was those things which were kicked into 2023 actually starting to happen, which is a really good sign for confidence. So, you know, lots of the headline data is actually quite helpful. Um, you know, the cost of the fuel bill stuff is not as great on. Uh, on the government as they thought it might be that has created a bit of space a landing zone on things like public sector pay which i think is helpful um consumer confidence while it's down is not really really bad and the consumer drives the british economy so there's all sorts of reasons for thinking that this is a, a bit of a meh year economically and um then you layer on the massive shortage of people that we've got in the UK. And that looks like in the short term, a good year for recruiters. The challenge for us as recruiters is to think about the sustainability of our market. And that's why even though shortages are obviously good for uh, those who can navigate them and have the right offer in the recruitment industry, we do also need to help clients and government address the shortages in a sustainable way because yeah, at the end of the day, the thing that will drive sustainability for the industry in 24, 25, 26 is a healthy and growing British economy. And we've already shown, you know, in the overcoming shortages work last year, that if we don't, we're basically spending two Elizabeth lines a year of growth on nothing. I wonder so if we it... can get the, uh, the government to adopt a meh year as being a technical definition. <laughs> <laughs> so I you see I did I did all my economics with David Metcalf, who was the oh. uh, some people might know him as the the David uh, the uh, director of labour market enforcement. But he was also on the Law Pay Commission, and David was great because he used to walk into lectures at London School of Economics and say, uh, "Right, I've been talking to the lads down at Smithfield, and this is what is happening at the in the economy, and and you've got you've got to go that way. You've got to." It, economics is just an agglomeration of people. I find out how local economies are doing by asking taxi drivers. So it's interesting, isn't it? I've been speaking to clients all, already, and I've been saying the same thing, is that if you go back, you're looking at what is it slowing down. I said, well, let's go back to 2019. 
what was January and February like in 2019? They went, oh, yeah, we get the Christmas slowdown and then it starts to creep up. March is either massive or small, depending on who's got budget to spend at the end of the financial year. But then April, May, June, July starts to really kick off and we're starting to oh. see that, absolutely starting to see that spot on. So it's interesting that you're seeing exactly the same thing. So the question I want to sort of pick on a little point that you made there about the, the temp market in the perm market, et cetera. We came out of lockdown all markets, perm, temp and contract took off. And obviously that was a thing that we weren't quite expecting. The usual trend as we start to come out of a slowdown is that temp market. So have you seen the change in the trends? You start to mention that. But if you look at, say, over the next two quarters, what are we likely to see as the job trends over the next couple of quarters rather than what we've just seen just happening now? So I have a legitimate question, which is how much further can the temp market grow? because it's been growing for two and a half years. And I think I, I think probably slow and steady growth in the temp market is the most achievable position um, because the candidate shortages are ameliorating a little bit. You know, IT in Britain has caught the cold from the valley. There are businesses having to make some quite difficult uh, uh, decisions. So there are layoffs happening. So there is candidate supply. I do think that people are starting to... Um, uh drift back into the labor market in a much more active way carberry's in uh index of uh in city behavior which is to do a head count every tuesday morning on who's waiting on the on uh on the uh 720 at my local station has gone through the roof in the last month so i think i th i think there's all sorts of people coming out of their shell a bit more sustainably in 23 starting to happen so where does that leave us? I think temp will remain strong just because shortages are so tight. Uh, perm will pick up, I suspect, but it won't pick up yet. I think perm might stabilize in Q2. And I think when, I, and then it should begin to pick up again. So I'm, I'm still thinking that taking in total um, the market for recruiters in Britain grows by mid single figures this year. Um, but as always, that is slanted towards Tim. Until, yeah, you because know, firms have been slow to ramp up Tim. It took, you know, I would say that by Easter, by Easter 2020, so what, three, four weeks into the first lockdown, we were starting to see activity happening again in temp and temp pretty much grew solidly from them until the second lockdown took a step back and, uh, and, and has grown for two and a half years since then. Um, perm didn't recover at all until the autumn of 2020 went right back down in the second lockdown and took a while to get going again. I mean, in reality, 2022 was the year of, per, uh, of really robust perm recovery. I think there's locked up demand there. And I think the challenge here for recruiters is that that demand in perm might be very different to the demand that's gone before. So, you know, I, I've talked on one of these before um, about solving the problems your clients have now. And I think that's really important. So every chief exec is thinking about what's the shape of business I need to compete in this new world. And that will involve some loss of people and some gain of people. And the art, um, without teaching grandmother to suck eggs on this call, is you get close to the people who are making those decisions. So what we're saying is then we're seeing the same trend that we saw in every recession that I've been through, bar the lockdown type of sort of a pandemic recession, that you temp market's going to come back but at the moment it's it's a saturated market and it's probably at its peak but it will go a little bit higher but not massively and then a, there's a slow sort of hockey stick return for your per market to come back and that sort of starts to accelerate towards the back end of the year is, is what we're seeing okay. yeah and the howard i think just a, a point worth making and it is a i mean as as neil says it's the most peculiar situation we find ourselves in there's some elements of what we're going through that's very traditional in relation to the way um, employers react in a recessionary climate, and Neil's described that very well. That's the usage and the increasing usage of temporary labour, whilst they feel very uncertain and rather insecure about taking on 
permanent stuff. That's traditional. I've seen that many times over the years. Um, but you know, it's on the it's on the platform of massive staff shortages, and perm shortages. And so, you know, when we talk to our clients, as we do all the time, about taking great quality candidates to the market, I still think that there is an opportunity for recruitment businesses to be very active in the perm market, provided they do they they exhibit proactive behaviour when they're actively engaged with committed permanent candidates because there are jobs still out there for those people um, and in that sense it isn't exactly the same as other recessionary climates we've witnessed in the past i agree very really strongly with that paul and i'll give you an example that i think illustrates the challenge that business owners and uh, and people who are facing clients inside agencies have and i was there i mentioned at the top of the call i was down in cardiff last week for the national forum And we had a discussion about how our clients reacting to where they are now. And around that table, at at the same table, you had people who had clients who were facing higher pay because of the nature of the the situation, a lot more difficulty um, hiring. And their cost control answer to that was to squeeze the agency margin. Mm. And, And you had other people who were saying, I'm doing more retained work than I've ever done in perm. And in temp, I'm getting a bigger margin because we've educated the client that this is more difficult and if we want if they want the other things that they've said they want like for instance proper access uh, and proper thinking about edi then that is going to cost a bit more and i think one of the biggest challenges for any senior client facing people in recruitment business right now is clients are all over the place because they're completely lost mm. in this world that, as Paul says, looks a bit like what's happened before, but isn't what has happened before. And you, when I, I, I quite often use it, it's quite a throwaway line. You know, if you've got the right product mix, yeah. you, you can succeed. Part of the right product mix is kind of putting an arm around the client's shoulder and saying, look, this is the world you're looking at, and this is your path through it. And I think that's going to be the difference maker for yep. the for firms in the industry over the next 18 months. And Neil, I mean, you very wise words. And you, you said what we consistently say to our clients, keep super tight to your clients at this moment. I mean, understand what their thoughts and their challenges are, um, even if they're not in a position presently to give you business. Keep yeah. close because I think, and this is a personal opinion, that when the perm market comes back, it'll come back as we witnessed before very swiftly. And as you say, that might be next year, but in my, you know, I'm, I'm of the opinion, I could be wrong, that we could see quite a strong uplift as we get into sort of the back third of 2023. That's where I am, Paul. I'm, okay. I'm, in, I'm in a perm recovery this year. If the economy, you know, if inflation falls in the way we expect it to, um, you know, notwithstanding anything uh, Vladimir Vladimirovich chooses to do, because that's the <laughs> great kind of unpredictable or, or indeed President Xi. I think it's true, it's, true. it's true as well, isn't it, for recruiters, because they are also navigating this strange new world of work. Yeah. So the clients are doing it, but we as recruiters are doing it as well, aren't we? Yeah, and uh, I think there's a real, we're doing some work at the moment, which hopefully will see the light of day tail end of the spring. And it, it sort of it rejoices in the name new forms of delivery. But in reality, what it is, is, kind of us and a few people sitting back and going if you designed an agency from scratch now Mm. what tech would you put in it and what people would you put in it and what would be the delivery model to clients yeah and you know and uh heather's former boss tim cook once said to me uh and i'm not going to do the voice heather uh what, what one said to me the challenge with technology and recruitment neil is that it's all designed to make consultants marginally more effective at what they do now, rather than solving clients and candidates problems. And so there's a whole thing about, you know, if we want it to be really effective as this professional service, uh, steal a line from Stephen Patrick and New Cross Healthcare, how do we humanize the process? Sorry, how how do we digitize the process and humanize the service? Because that's, that's where we're going, like it or not. And that story, what's the digital stack that really makes a difference? And then what's, um, you know, what are we training our consultants to do? Was up at the C, uh, at uh, 
uh, the CBI in Scotland and uh, then meeting some of our members um, a few weeks ago and a big discussion there about how do we get people up to speed internally in this world. Um, so there's a whole slew of things that are the interaction of that, that we're good. The REC will publish something on and then try to ferment a debate in the industry on over the summer, because I think we've talked a lot about the professional service, the client relationship for years and years, and lots of firms do it really well. But I think it's now becoming a survivability point for for agencies. That sounds like an REC spring statement, Neil. Well, you know, we try. <laughs> <laughs> so looking at that then, obviously economic cycles go up, they go down across all industry sectors. So you're obviously getting a lot of data coming through at the moment and you, you're talking about using data and how you know we can change that uh, when we start to build new recruitment agencies, but more old recruitment agencies into new recruitment agencies. You know, which sex do you see growing at the moment and which do you see potentially not recovering at all? So I think some of the really big stuff we, we know, right? Retail employs a lot of people. Uh, I remember sitting in a room with, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, Justin, uh, Justin King when he was CEO of Sainsbury's and he, uh, and he sort of growled under his voice, it's all very well for the government to have a cabinet meeting at Rolls-Royce once a quarter, but, you know, everyone works for me and Terry Leahy at Tesco. It, largely it was true. So sector like retail, big employment numbers, we know they're going to get smaller secularly across cycles for for uh, years and years and years. Uh, on the flip side, hospitality, absolutely desperate for staff, absolutely desperate. And it's not, and hospitality is not going to get yeah. any less hungry. I think that the direction of travel, um, anything to do with the supply chain of goods to your home. Um, I think it is inevitable that the supply chain for home shopping delivery that we have in the UK changes. I think this idea that you can have it tomorrow for two ninety five is utterly unsustainable economically. But we are going to have to maintain that supply chain. So warehousing and all of that, while it will digitize, in fact, the scale of it is such that you might just see the employment numbers flatline and productivity go up. Um, IT is having a tough time. Um, and I think in IT, the way to think of it is this is a sector that is a good long term bet, we know. Mm -hmm. But we are coming off 10 years of next to free money. And there are a lot of bad businesses that can survive when money is next to free. And so a lot of what is being thrown out by the Valley right now is, you know, businesses that have never turned a profit and might never turn a profit. Um, and, and so there'll be a big change in tech. I think we'll, in 10 years time, tech will still be a big sector and still have growing demand. Yeah. I think it'll look differently and it'll be bumpy between now and then. Uh, constructions come back really strongly this month. And I think um, it will rem it, it, it will behave in line with um, the economy, particularly house building. Uh, civils, civils is a classic area where, you know, come back to my comments about an industrial strategy earlier, we're coming off the back of a long period of investment. HS2 is the kind of really the last big build of the sort of Blair Brown coalition eras. After that, it's not so clear where the civil pipeline is beyond a motorway junction here and there. So there's a big bit about industrial strategy. And what do we want to build in civils? And that will define the success in, in construction. Healthcare is going to grow and grow and grow. Social care is going to grow and grow and grow. And we are going to have to think about how we redesign what people do. And a big role, I think, for healthcare and social care agencies and social work agencies actually as well, is to think about how we play a role in service redesign. So here's a question then that I have sort of more of two questions that come from the, the audience, one from Andy Turner and one from Lara. You know, 
And they're saying that there's going to be an inevitable change in the government in 2024. So how will that affect the relationship with the REC and how will that affect the, with the relation with, with the new government? And in general, with the shortage, you know, is the government going to open up sponsorship for international candidates to come into the marketplace? So um, I'll deal with Lara's, on Lara's point first. Actually, I think the the new visa system only feels problematic in terms of process if you're used to free movement. And by comparison with what went before for non-EU, it's much easier and it's actually it's quite easy to get permission to bring people in. Um, its problem is it's expensive. It's massively costly. So when Omalara asked about why clients and financial services aren't interested, well, smaller businesses... I think the costs are prohibitive and the process is prohibitive. Larger businesses, I think possibly there's some work to be done to connect the people who are responsible for visas to the internal recruiters, because I think there's some discussion to have there. Um, I do think that British politics lags public opinion by a couple of years. You know, if, if you ask me on the weekend what i think the biggest problem in british politics is it's that politicians for a decade have engaged in followership not leadership mm. i actually i actually think that's why um i actually think that's why rishi sunak's had a good 24 hours because this is the first time in a while we were seeing a politician go no that's what we need to do it's the right thing to do stick a, pla uh, a flag a flag in it and, and and hope people follow rather than reflect have a look at the polling on immigration the polling on immigration says we're concerned about boats in the channel. Um, that is not an unfixable problem. You just have to do some things that the Home Secretary doesn't like, like a deal with France. Um, the rest of immigration for work does not register anymore as an issue in British public opinion. In fact, I would argue it, it didn't even register before the pandemic because when you ask people about people coming to work and contribute, it's usually pretty positive. So I do think there's space for a, 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 more, a further move to a more permissive system as people understand how deep the shortages are. Um, I think it probably does require a change of government, which kind of brings you to the point about relationships with change of government. I wouldn't go as far as inevitable yet. A week is a long time in politics, as Harold Macmillan famously uh, commented. Um, the Labour Party has a hell of a big hill to climb. Um, it needs to be like 12% ahead in the polls just to get majority. So let's not pretend that it's inevitable yet that what we're seeing is Keir Starmer's Labour Party with a workable majority after the 2024 general election. Having said that, it's very difficult to see a world where Keir Starmer isn't the Prime Minister in some form after a general election. Mm. Uh, Labour, I think, have very gradually, very slowly been doing some sensible things. A, a strength that is, always a, that is also a weakness. Labour does not understand how companies think about um, engaging labor and managing labor and productivity from labor. That's the weakness. It's a weakness they share with the conservatives. The strength is they know they don't know in a way that the conservatives don't actually know they don't know. Um, and therefore they are very open to discussions with businesses. Um, and we've had some really good, some really good, strong discussions with them over the last few years. If you've uh, months, if you've um, read their green paper on employment, that's currently their policy for the manifesto. We are working very hard on changing some of it. Um, day one, unfair dismissal rights are great, but did they understand when they wrote that that they just that they just made probation periods illegal? Probably not. So that, that that kind of work is ongoing. Where we, I think we have some strengths. One is they get the point about the scale of the industry. And they also get the point that what, now that what they need to do is work with bodies like the REC to have a successful agency sector and permanent recruitment sector that um, protects people who are working through it rather than say where we have been 
uh, it was a bit of a Welsh theme this morning for St David's Day, where we have been on in Wales with the NHS, where the answer is, oh no, we don't like agencies, we shouldn't use them. And then continue to use agencies anyway, but without any platform to think about how you use agency well, either in terms of public spending or quality of care or treatment of staff. So there's a there's a platform there that I think we're working. And the thing that the the thing that's really paid off for us somewhat ironically is the government deciding to abolish regulation seven last summer about um uh, about um uh, not using agency workers to uh, to cover strikes. Now REC members were four square you know, one or two voices, but four square behind the idea that Regulation 7 was a good idea because you don't want to be putting temps into someone else's dispute. Um, that landed incredibly well on the Labour benches, you know, to up to meeting with the leader's office, deputy leader's office. Um, there was a line in the statement that was given from the front bench um, uh, in Parliament when it was debated that was written by us. So that, that quality of relationship is there. I'm not going to pretend it's not going to be difficult because a lot of people in the backbenches who genuinely don't like agency work. Um, but I think we've got a platform. And realistically, I think the relationship's as good as it's been in a decade or more. I mean, those of you who can remember that far, Ed Miliband was fond of uh, having a pop at the sector. Uh, when he was leader, we're not there. We're in a better position than that. And there'll be a lot of work to do. But a change of government and a change of tone, I think, is absolutely essential. And where, where I, I think we got to this week, actually, credit to Rishi Sunak, is I think we're at the end of the Brexit wars. The, the tone of government when the Windsor Agreement was announced, how it was handled, how it's been responded to, felt much more redolent of things that happened before. That's how Keir Starmer's running the Labour Party as well. I think there's a taste in the country for moving away from some of this populist stuff. And that is good news for the business community, broadly, um, on both sides of the house. And I think the critical thing now is to, to use the opportunity to get the points that really matter across. So looking at that, then, we talk about the political things at the moment. We're, we're all talking about the candidate drive, and it's a candidate-driven market. It's candidate short. You know, we look at the drop in the birth rate from 64 down to where it is now, et cetera. Put Brexit on top of that. and You're saying the Brexit wars are open. You know, if there is such a candidate shortage, do you see then that changing? Because we can't see that changing for a time. So how do recruitment agencies adjust in order to service the market if it is such you know product short yeah i think uh, i i think this is the getting upstream point which is broadly most clients have a balance across what do we buy what do we borrow what do we grow and and where can we have it at what sorts of levels now if we're niche specialists in what we do um we ought to be better positioned to help clients reach the, those conclusions than they would be themselves. And indeed, than they would be if they got some um, management consultant in to give the advice. Um, and they'd also be significantly better off if they used us rather than McKinsey's. Um, so there's a whole thing about um, this being at the heart of the nature of the discussion that we're having. And I remember Neil Morrison at Seven Trent say, saying to me, I don't want to hear that it's difficult from a consult from a recruitment firm. I want to hear that this is a big job, but they know how to do it. So that's the challenge broadly, which is, you know, we need to be better that we, we need to be better, appreciably vastly better at navigating a poorly yielding field yeah. than any of the other options. Yeah. I'd... So, so what, you're, what you're saying then is then that the bums on seats, we can just throw it as much mud against the wall and hope it sticks, is disappearing and more consultative, more proactive ways of sourcing and understanding the sourcing needs from your clients is absolutely where the, the, the recruitment market should be going. 
And how just to just to pick up on that point, I think that um, you know recruitment businesses, particularly mature recruitment businesses, some of whom are on this uh, webinar today, have a pretty vast pool of talent sitting on their CRMs mm. that need engagement. And I mean, Neil made the point earlier about tech. Um, it's so important, I think, for recruitment companies to to expend energy, time and even investment now in making sure that they find all sorts of methods to engage with their existing candidate database, let alone um, looking at how they're going to identify candidates who are in the market, not necessarily on the market. And I, you know, we're in a good place to do that. But it is to your point, Howard, it's not a question of just chucking mud against the wall. It is working smarter. And I think the opportunity is there for lots of recruitment businesses to be able to find those candidates in the market um, uh, in a way that perhaps we haven't necessarily adopted in the past. It's interesting, isn't it? Because we talk about measuring our clients, you know, pipelines, etc. If you take a, a recruitment agency that's even got say 20,000 candidates on a candidate database and you take the average spend of a candidate or placing a candidate at 4k that's 80 million pounds sat on a database that maybe isn't being utilized if you then took that and said 20 percent of that is what's looking for a job at the time that's still 16 million pounds if you paste just 10 percent of that you'd be really happy you know so we're not utilizing our candidate database at all and yet we then go out and spend lots of money on you know job adverts etc 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 so and i am aware howard of one of the major household name firms who reckons that a third of the candidates they sourced from external methods were already sitting on their database. Uh -huh. I hear that paid, for access, paid, yeah. paid for access for them. Uh, I've got. I mean, I, I can I can validate that point because I've got a client that told me a few years ago actually that uh, here was the good news, here was the bad news. The bad news uh, was that uh, something in the order of seventy percent of the candidates that it placed in the previous year had already sat were already sat on his on his database, but we'd spent money again. To find them through job boards and, and other methods so and i think it's it's just that's unfortunately pretty typical that we carry on as howard said spending money over and over again to attract the very same candidates we've already attracted i think bullhorn and there are other, other crms are out there available i think bullhorn described it as six out of ten placements in the uk are made by candidates who are already on your database but you've recorded them at least two or three times in the past one of the big questions I keep getting asked, and there are some other questions coming from some, from, from the, the board, but this question I keep getting asked by lots of uh, agencies, the Harper Trust versus Brazil. Okay. What is going to be the real impact on the recruitment industry with the potential changes of how holiday pay is calculated and potentially how is it accrued by temporary workers? Um, right, settle in. It's, it's a long story. Um, so, so there's a few bits here. Let's not beat around the bush. The working time regulations are a mess. And if you're searching for a potential Brexit uh, benefit, simplifying the working time regulations, not to change the rights, keep the holiday, keep the rest break, keep the working hours, keep the opt out, um, would make life very, very uh, much easier. To, and it, it's part of a general push, which is, you know, we write regulations for people with open-ended employment contracts who are employees. Um, so impact-wise, I think broadly it is manageable if you get your processes right. And that probably means P45ing people relatively regularly. Now, that doesn't mean after every assignment, because obviously if you're a, a supply agency for education, the assignment is usually a day. But just making sure you're managing the risk you're putting onto your balance sheet feels really important. Um, obviously, at the moment, the REC's read is that this is a case about an employee, not about a worker. Um, that doesn't mean that there won't be a case that comes along in due course that is about a worker. So yeah, the, there are short-term and long-term risks. And um, the third bit of this is then, well, what's the appetite for changing the uh, the way the working time regs work? And I think the Bayes 
uh, consultation, which is live at the moment. And I'd in encourage every recruitment business to th who's affected by this to think about responding and also to contribute to the REC's work. Um, it's very clear that actually we do need a rule of thumb. And that rule of thumb might look different in different places, but um, um, I think it is um, there is potential to to address this over time. And as always, government moves move slower than agencies would want it to. So that's a long way of saying focus now on getting your processes right and managing your uh, liabilities. Um, and there's lots of advice on the REC website with that for members. Two, think about your balance of um, liabilities over the long term. So just because you're not employing your temps, if you've got temps on contract for service, that doesn't mean you won't be caught by it ultimately when the, the next case comes through. And then third, um, contribute to solving the problem. And the problem is uh, bad drafting in the uh, in the uh, in the working time regulations. So interesting, isn't it, when you sort of look at it that? So here's a question that sort of leads on from what we've been talking all the way through. That's coming from uh, uh, John. You know, will recruiters or will the recruitment market invest more in technology than in 2023 than they did in 22 to overcome the challenges that we're facing this year and beyond? Difficult to tell. I think. Probably much the same, maybe slightly more. Um, you know, that piece around, I mean, John said in his comment, being prepared to iterate, process, and text that relentlessly, I think that's essential. Um, I think the big challenge is slightly different, which is how much bang are you getting for your buck? Um, I think deployment and adoption of tech and cultural kind of expectations of consultants and indeed tech providers understanding of what they're trying to deliver is huge. Um, if I were being unkind, I would say one of our big problems is, is that the primary advisors to, te uh, to uh, agencies on tech stack tend to be vendors for providers. And because of that, my system does anything you want, Gov. And don't worry, don't worry if it doesn't do it out of the box, we'll build you a load of APIs that will sort that out for you yeah. which will just be a complete absolute mess yeah. uh, and i bear i i bear the the scars of having deployed crm to membership organizations twice in my career <laughs> neither of them i've choose to relive um so i think if you think about your tech investment forgive the pun you need to have some people who don't have an agency problem uh so you need some people on your side of the bridge who are saying we've talked to the business and we understand the business processes and this is the tech solution that will really help. Mm. Now let's go to the market with that and work out and try and deploy something that's as close to out of the box as possible and then relentlessly consequence manage. And you have to get desks, heads and others onto this, the usage of the system by, sure. by the team. So that, that probably speaks to not investing more in terms of pure cash on tech and licensing but probably investing more in terms of understanding and deployment. And if I were owner manager of a of an agency, that would be in my thought process because there's so much stuff that, and it's not just in our sector, every business is bought that just doesn't touch the sides because, mm -hmm. because it's not adopted, it's not deployed, it's not made use of. You know, we're three years into the CRM deployment at the REC. There is utility that we can still drive from it because we're still learning how to how to use it. Um, and that, and I think that's true for, for any business. I think that's what we see right across the marketplace, that anybody who buys new tech, the worst thing they have is the uptake of that tech and the upkeep of the tech because the lack of training that goes on from the supplier and the lack of that engagement from the, the from the, the recruitment population because they don't see the benefits from it. And that leads to a sort of second question that's come from someone who's a, who wants to remain anonymous is, you know, do we see people, you know, full-time going back into the office? Do we see part-time? What, what are we seeing on that sort of view of, working back into the office or are we going to still see lots of part-time work etc cetera, etc cetera, working from home so yeah people people who work from home full-time are working full-time howard yeah 
yeah dinosaur um there's a kind of there's there's a there's a piece here about um let's talk about the industry right by and large um um by and large if you're in a recruitment business on a business park on the edge of town and people could drive to work you've been back in pretty much you might be doing some hybrid you might have people in at home on one or two days a week but you've been roughly back in in your cities it's completely different absolutely and has been different for a while we are definitely seeing now cities filling up again and not just Car- Carberry's metric on the train platform I'm getting it from major yep. recruiters with big offices in cities saying no we're going back two three four days um, I think hybrid is here to stay particularly in cities, partially because people have got used to the cheaper commuting costs. And now is absolutely the the moment when you don't want to be ramping people's costs up because of inflation. Um, But I kind of agree with Tony Danker at CBI when he said most bosses secretly want people back because what I am definitely seeing is people, you know, right, we're in our sort of five little boxes here, right? People can see us in our five little boxes. And when you're working in your little box, I've got my job, I get it done, I'm productive at home. But part of my job is, I mean, I'm not at home today, I'm in the RAC's office. Part of my job is to be around. And part of all senior staff's job to be around, not least to help early career workers uh, navigate things. But also, there's something about the trust and relationships you build up. So I think what's really important for agencies, and I think for clients as well, is to be thinking about how do I build productivity and how much time do I need people together to deliver that? And then to be really bold about um, saying this is what the business needs. Um, One of the things, you know, I'm in... By background, I'm an employer relations guy. I do trade union negotiations as uh, uh, in terms of early early career. And the thing that drives me nuts is when we talk about this as an employee, uh, employee benefit. This is a mode of production, right? And there are things that we as employers need to happen. And they're non-negotiable. And in the REC membership where hybrid has flown best, it's flown best in those situations where owners and operators have said, this is the stuff we need and it's non-negotiable. Now let's work around that in ways that work for you. And got, there's one great example of a member uh, up in Scotland who went from two days in to three days in and it absolutely, tra- there was there was two weeks of complaining and it transformed relationships in the business because people were seeing each other. So I think I, I tend to agree that, that there is definitely a drive back and there is definitely a view of it is better for relationship building both internally and externally and for productivity and so it'd be, it'd be really interesting on that so last question because we've gone just just one just one more thing because just thinking about the question it was there is obviously a job here for recruiters in educating candidates as well as uh, as as well uh, as well as clients so there's something about you know what candidates want isn't necessarily what they can have and that, and that Again, it's a great piece of call, you know, a great piece of advice, but it's not just advising there, advising their clients, their clients, clients and candidates as, as well from there. So we've gone massively over time. So I'm going to ask one last question to finish off. Obviously, the recruitment industry is always changing. If you had one critical piece of advice for all recruitment leaders for the next 12 months, what would that be? Never stop talking to your clients or people who could be your clients. As a se- as senior a level you can, Right you don't know what they think their problems are until they've told you what their problems are. Yep. And once you understand their problems, you can either think I can solve those or actually I can offer some good advice that isn't me solving those, but it will flow back on me being seen as an expert or I can't solve those. Um, but that piece around, you know, and it, it unashamedly stolen from Greg, who you started with, but I think it's absolutely right. You know, ultimately the closer we are to our clients, the more we're doing. It's why it's a joy run, running the REC because, of course, our customers are also our shareholders. Uh, so, yeah, it makes life easy in that regard. 
So what you're saying from a candidate's client's point of view and consultant's point of view, nobody knows how much you care until you show them how much you care. Yeah, very pithy, Howard. Much, uh, much, uh, that's much, more present- much more presentable than mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're good at piss, aren't you, Howard? That's one of your one of your talents. I, I would I would come back with a, a, something off, but then I'll, I'll that would be piss yeah. as well. Then you'll get in <laughs> you will get in trouble. I, I mean, I think this point is so valid. You you know, for 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 recruitment businesses to use this time, as described earlier, if it is going to be a bit soft um, in terms of the burn market to use this time to build relationship platforms that will will provide benefit as we start to move towards the back end of this year and into 2024. You know, all we know relationships take time to build. It doesn't happen overnight. Building trust doesn't isn't something you gain with one or two visits. But now the opportunity is there. And I think if people regard, look at the medium to long-term strategies, this is a brilliant opportunity to get very tight to organizations. So that, you know, when the when the when the tide changes, we can we can take advantage, as it were, and really be very close to people as they start to grow their staff um, staff numbers once again. So that just leaves to say to Neil, thank you, thank you very much. It's been an absolute, absolute pleasure. pleasure, absolute pleasure. Thanks, Neil, always interesting, and the insight is always great. And for the recruitment people that've been on today. Thank you very much for attending. Thanks for all your questions. Obviously, the recording will be live, so you can push it out to across all your businesses and across all your staff from there. Neil, thank you very much. I'll probably see you in two weeks' time at the uh, expo uh, from yeah. there. Next week's ladies and gentlemen, we're going to talk about managers and how they are the most effective people in your business. And from what Neil's saying today with regards to communicating with your clients, candidates, and your consultants to improve the service offerings, then we can sort of work on that and how we can improve on that. Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the last of the week. Thank you very much. Neil, once again, thanks for your time. And we'll see you all next week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.